design and installation. Family owned in Howard County. More at sunnurseries.com. State Circle is made by MPT to serve all of our diverse communities and is made possible by the generous support of our members. Thank you. Connecting Marylanders to their government. This is State Circle. Good evening. Welcome to State Circle. Coming up tonight, clearing up the confusion over voting by mail plus how one state university is operating during the pandemic. But first tonight, top state Democrats reject a call from other Democrats for an emergency special session of the legislature. A group of progressive organizations put together a mock special session outdoors to demonstrate how lawmakers could safely meet to pass bills on police reform, eviction prevention, and issues they say cannot wait until next year. They were surprised when Speaker Adrian Jones and Senate President Bill Ferguson turned up and said there would be no emergency meeting of the legislature. We spoke with the Senate President. Senator, thank you for being with us. What was your message to the members of Progressive Maryland and the other groups that want the legislature to convene in a special session? Well, first and foremost, the message was to thank them for their advocacy. Uh, we have seen an enormous amount of energy and focus on helping one's neighbors. And the advocacy community is rightfully uh, scared, just as individual Marylanders are, and they want to see solutions. Um, and they're frustrated. And, and, I would say, and what I wanted to explain to them is that we get it, because we feel the same way. The question that we have to wrestle with is when is the best time for us to make the biggest and most positive impact for Marylanders? And right now we are in such a moment of uncertainty. In, on November 3rd, we have a presidential election that will produce two to or could produce two totally different outcomes for our country and then as that relates to the state of Maryland. And so if we were to meet now prior to knowing what the federal landscape looks like, we would be making decisions about generational items with really imperfect information. And of course, we want to solve every problem we can at that moment. Um, but in this moment, we can't afford to make a, a wrong decision or a hasty choice. We've got to wrestle with all of the facts as they are. And so the best time for the legislature to meet again is in January when we have better information about the landscape. Is it a factor in your, your decision and the speaker's decision um, that the, the idea of physically bringing together 188 legislators and staff members as apparently, based on the attorney general's opinion, may be, may be necessary, has the potential to be you know, a super spreader event in the middle of, of a pandemic? Uh, do you think there's a way to do all of this virtually? And, and does that factor into this decision? Well, of course. Health, health outcomes for our members and staff and, and the folks that are in Annapolis uh, certainly is, is the thing that, that keeps me up at night. Um, that said, we've been working since May to think about what a different type of session could look like. Uh, we have begun those procedures, reviewed the policy. Of course, we have to make sure that everything is legal and constitutional, that is primary, and we have to make sure that people are safe. I think we can put the right protections in place to have uh, sort of a hybrid approach. Uh, I do think that the Attorney General's opinion made clear that there are some parts of the legislative process that do require a physical presence in Annapolis. Uh, and so we are working towards making sure that we have sa a safe environment for those parts of the session to occur physically in the, uh, the state's capital. Uh, that said, we're also building out the systems to have remote options, and we've been deploying some of those throughout the interim. Uh, in fact, next week, uh, the Judicial Proceedings Committee will be holding uh, bill hearings on a series of 15 bills around police reform and community trust, and we're starting to deploy some of the tactics that have been worked on and created to sort of try them out so that when we get to the General Assembly session period, we'll have those systems in place. You know, the great thing is anybody who's interested in that, in, in police reform and the related issues, will be able to tune in. It'll be on the legislature's website. It's an unusual thing because the legislature's not convened. The bills are not formally before the committee. So what's the purpose? 
Yeah, you know, I, I, this is a really complicated issue when we talk about police reform. And I think a lot of times in these complicated emotional issues, it's really easy to get lost in the philosophical argument, in the ideas, and not the words on the page. And so our theory was, let's get legislation drafted. And really, I want to thank our, our chairman, Will Smith, uh, of the Senate Judicial Proceedings Committee, who just has the talent and expertise and, and in personal experience to lead in a moment like this. And we knew that we were going to do something. And my first call was, was to Senator Smith to say, this is the moment. Um, and I, you know, I, we need to do this together and you're going to lead the charge here. Um, and so he grabbed the bull by the horns and said, we should really do a bill hearing process. We should look at the words on the page. We should get amendments. We should hear from as many stakeholders as we can so that by the time we come in for session, we have not ideas and concepts. We have words on a page that we can, that we can ensure are actionable. Your personal opinion on this, the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights, a big focus for, for people who want to see changes in, in policing. Uh, I don't think there's been a session where that hasn't been considered uh, and it's largely intact. Do you want to see uh, changes to that or do you want to see it repealed? I think we're going to see some substantial, substantial uh, reforms to the Law Enforcement Bill of Rights. You know, there are provisions within uh, the Bill of Rights that protect whistleblowers, officers who, uh, who do see something wrong and say something about it uh, to make the, the force more honorable. I don't think we want to repeal those types of things. Uh, the other issue that I have with a full-on repeal is that I think one of the challenges in the state of Maryland is that we don't have uniform standards of police misconduct, uh, uh, use of force issues, appropriate training. This uh, policing is too important and we have got to have set standards. There's going to be local variation here and there, but we need to have very clear state uh, priorities about what we believe the profession of policing should look like. If we were to repeal it entirely, we would have the hundreds of police agencies that exist across the state of Maryland negotiating their own individual provisions. I think that would be a big mistake. And so what I, what I believe we will be moving forward this year, and, and nothing is predestined, uh, but reform will come. Uh, we want to see a clear set of standards that is uh, applicable across the state of Maryland so that all members of our society, uh, Black Marylanders, White Marylanders, Latino Marylanders, Asian, Amer uh, Asian Marylanders, that we all feel uh, safe and secure and that we're all going to the same place, which is to maximize our God-given potential without the fear of violence. Uh, that's the goal, and that's what we'll be fighting for. Before we go, um, you are a former teacher, and we spent a lot of time last week looking at the difficulties with virtual education, the thousands of students around Maryland who apparently have, have not to this point been able to connect at all, so they've been without any sort of, of uh, face-to-face -face or virtual face-to-face -face instruction from a teacher for six months or more. Um, how, how are we doing? How could we do better? What's the path forward? Yeah, I mean, look, I, you know, I don't want to be an armchair quarterback um, in, in this situation because this has been an unbelievable, unbelievably difficult situation. And while I was a former teacher and worked in education for, for many, many years, uh, right now I'm, I'm also a parent. I'm a parent of a third grader and first grader who are in sort of virtual learning pods at our public school in Baltimore City. Uh, I am incredibly thankful to the educators and, and superintendents who have been working tirelessly all summer to try and prepare for this extraordinary moment. Um, where I feel the most frustrated is the severe lack of leadership from the State Board of Education. Um, it has been honestly unconscionable, the lack of guidance that has been provided by the state. In these difficult moments, there's no right answer there is a best case and reduced risk answer. And the state of Maryland and the State Department of Education needed to step in and set clear metrics, clear guidance to give people the level of confidence that they could send their kids back to school. Um, that lack of guidance has led this patchwork of policies across the state that I hope will change. Um, I also am severely, severely disappointed in the lack of work done to provide the basic infrastructure for virtual learning. Um, I said before that, you know, starting this school year that we knew was going to be virtual in some way or a high likelihood of, 
without the knowledge of which students had access to, in, to a computer and broadband is like trying to send kids to a school without a roof. And to think that the State Department of Education spent three months over the summer not thinking about this question and hoping that it would work out, to me, it's unacceptable. Um, and so we're gonna have to backfill and try and find ways to fix this. We know there are way too many of kids, thousands and thousands of kids who are not getting the experience that they need. And we have some serious work on the back end to really reform and move the needle for, for kids who we know are, are not getting the chance to maximize their potential. Senate President Bill Ferguson, uh, sir, thank you for the time. Thank you. Meantime, Governor Hogan told WBAL Radio this week that he lacks the power to order school boards to reopen. He said the state superintendent and I have both pushed and urged and nudged as many of them as possible to return as many kids as we can safely. Now to the complicated matter of getting absentee ballots to all of the Marylanders who are hoping to vote by mail. Our Nancy Amata tells us what voters need to know. As of right now, my wife and I, we are planning to do mail-in um, because of the coronavirus and having a young child who is home. Safety and convenience of a lot of people planning to vote by mail this election. I just decided I'm gonna vote by mail only because with this pandemic and I've got three kids at home and I'm teleworking, there's just too much going on. This year, over 750,000 people have requested a mail-in ballot, up from 250,000 requests in 2016. If you wanna vote by mail, make your request now. You have to ask for a mail-in ballot. It's not automatically gonna be sent to you. Nikki Charlson is the deputy administrator at the Maryland State Board of Elections. She says ballot requests must be received by October 20th. And once you receive your ballot, you should fill it out, sign the back of it, and return your ballot to a drop box or post office by October 15th. We want to count your ballots, but there are a few rules that you have to follow. And so follow instructions and make a plan. This week, you may have received this postcard from the U.S. Post Office explaining how you could vote by mail. Well, state election officials say you can disregard it. It's good to be promoting voting. It's very difficult to produce a single flyer, a single mailer that captures 50 different state laws. And so there are so there's some missing information and then one piece of inconsistent information on that flyer. For those who want to vote in person, figure out what's the closest voting location and vote early. That gives you lots of time to make an adjustment. If you get to your voting center on day two of early voting and it's busy, you now have other days to plan. You can vote in person or at an early voting center from October 26th to November 2nd. There are 81 locations across the state. Um, but you want to pick an early voting center in the county where you live. Um, typically, the slowest times are the Saturday and Sunday. So if you want to get in and out, that's a good, good day to go. And you can always vote in person on November 3rd. To check if you're registered, request a ballot, track your ballot, or for more information on polling places and hours, head to elections.maryland.gov 2020. I'm Nancy Yamada for State Circle. Nancy, thank you, and State Circle continues in a moment. Can you tell us what you know? Fire us. You're the Turning back now to the race for the White House. The, the State Board of Elections voted Thursday to set up a new election. It must be a very emotional day. The world changed in the blink of an eye. Children are at the heart of this story. Our newsmaker this week is Anthony Jenkins, the president of Coppin State University. Dr. Jenkins, thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be here. Pleasure to have you. You have been on the job there for all of three and a half months, so you had lots of time to, to settle in and get the lay of the land before you got to work, right? That's right. That's right. Tell, so t tell me what's happening there in terms of, do you have students on campus? How are you dealing with things this semester? Yeah, you know, we uh, made a decision uh, over the course of the spring semester that we were going to uh, have a low density uh, model here on campus. And that simply meant that we were going to bring back some of our students, not all of our students, 
but also to have about 10% of our classes operate in a face-to-face -face, um, uh, type of modality. And then about 90% of our classes would continue to be virtual. We focused on that 10% face-to-face by really looking at those courses that traditionally uh, give incoming freshmen a little more uh, difficulty. And so we wanted to make sure that we could get them off to a much better start, a stronger start. And we thought face-to-face -face would really lend itself to doing so. And so we reduced the capacity in our residence halls uh, to just about 50%. So we have about 300 students living on campus with us. And any given day, we have approximately uh, four to 500 individuals moving throughout campus, students, faculty, and essential staff that are on campus to help make sure that the uh, university continues to function at a high level. How's it going in, in terms of, you know, testing and uh, the results of that testing? You know, what uh, we did early on was before everyone uh, was required to uh, return to campus, uh, they were mandated to have an actual COVID-19 test. And so we wanted to establish our baseline. Uh, we were able to test uh, nearly 400 individuals who were going to be on campus at that particular time. And uh, between our first test and our current test that we are having today, and, and the results of these tests will uh, be back here in a couple of days. But right now, our positivity rate is just at about 2%. And so we feel pretty good about the structure and the procedures that we've put in place. Of course, we purchase masks for all students, all faculty and all staff. Masks are required on every aspect of campus. And I tell you, you know, Jeff, our students are doing an incredible job. Um, they are really following the actual process and the protocols that we've put in place. And as a result of that, that's why we have such a low positive, uh, positive rate here on campus. I saw the, the Sun story this week that indicated that uh, uh, enrollments are down almost everywhere. Uh, Coppin included, so that affects both your, your budget, um, but also your, your ability to, to do the mission that you're there to do. Yeah, you know, um, when you look at the impact of this pandemic uh, on institutions like uh, ours, um, there, are, there are multiple levels of complexity that we have to deal with. Uh, what we've seen from our students in the decline that we have this current fall as opposed to the previous fall, we have heard from our students and the factors have really uh, fallen into three categories. Uh, financial, um, the actual teaching modality that we are, we are offering, uh, and then students um, not really feeling comfortable um, uh, returning to campus in the midst of a global pandemic. And so from a financial standpoint, we have so many of our students uh, who are Pell eligible, who are first generation college students. And so with many of those individuals, if having to choose between work, paying the bills and helping out their families, unfortunately, higher education takes a back seat to those very important necessities to enhance the quality of their life. Uh, the students also have not favored the virtual modality that we and many other institutions are using. Students will tell you, I signed up for a face-to-face -face education. I like the structure. I like being on campus, uh, access to university resources. And so when those things are not there, it makes it a little more challenging for students to really develop that type of nurturing, supportive environment that so many of them need to get to the end of their journey. And so we've seen that have an impact on our students and more of our students have stopped out and have said that they're going to either sit out this semester or next semester as well while the pandemic uh, passes. Their goal is to eventually get back to us. Uh, but we want to keep reaching out to those individuals, keeping them motivated and doing all we can to get them back to Coppin so they can earn their degree. Because listen, let's be honest, our city, our state and our nation needs their diversity, their emotional intelligence and their intellectual strength. 
Let's talk about uh, HBCUs. Uh, Coppin is one of the four historically black institutions in Maryland, but, but specifically your campus. What, what, are the, um, what draws people there? What are, what are the top subjects? What are the growth areas? What, what do you hope to be uh, you know, in the next couple of years of, of your tenure? You know, excellent question and thank you. Um, you know, listen, we like all institutions uh, across our nation, we have visions of growing and we are putting plans in place to make sure uh, that happens. We have always been committed to access and opportunity and with the student population that we really cater to, those high academic achieving students and those students that need a little more academic support, you know, we believe that it's important that we lift that, that bottom quartile. And so access and opportunity, affordability, we are the most affordable university in the USM system. And so students come to Coppin to earn a quality education. Some of our major signature academic programs are uh, our health, um, uh, health professions. Uh, our nursing program is um, a highly ranked nursing program. We lead all of the HBCUs in the state in producing the most number of African-American nurses. African-American nurses with uh, a doctorate in nursing. Our business programs, our criminal justice, our STEM areas are very strong. Uh, we are doing groundbreaking research in nanotechnology. Uh, we have a lot of great opportunities before us and some signature high demand academic programs to really support the growth of our institution and to meet the needs uh, of what our city and our state and region needs. And so I'm excited about the uh, future of Coppin. Yes, it is going to take some work for us to get out of this pandemic, continue to build inroads of opportunity. But if there's any institution that can do it, Coppin can do it. We've been changing lives and turning the impossible into the possible for 120 years. President Jenkins, uh, congratulations on the, on the new position and thank you, sir, for the time. Thank you, and I greatly appreciate you stopping by and visiting us here at Coppin. September is Underground Railroad Month in Maryland, and a new set of exhibits is intended to advance educational tourism on the Eastern Shore. Three, two, one. About 20 miles east of the Chesapeake Bay Bridge is the new Frederick Douglass Park on the Tuckahoe. State and local officials gathered at the site, not far from the birthplace of the abolitionist and statesman. It is important to both recognize and celebrate the legacy left by Frederick Douglass, who exemplified courage and self-determination to free himself from, the bondage, uh, from bondage, illiteracy, and poverty to become world-renowned anti-slave activist and supporter of social justice, which is still, which still many cry out for today. A growing list of attractions around the state helps to bring to life stories of heroism and determination led by Marylanders, including Douglas and Harriet Tubman. Although they endured almost unimaginable challenges and trauma in their lifetime, they ne never gave up on gaining their freedom and helping others to do the same. More information on all the attractions can be found at visitmaryland.org. A piece of Maryland history is back on the water, and our Sue Copen tells us its future will be in connecting the past to the present. The crew of the Wilma Lee is getting things ready for their next trip out on the Chesapeake Bay. The skipjack included in the National Park Service's Register of Historic Places is finally home and ready to plow the bay's waters once again. So we acquired the skipjack in June of 2016. We've spent the better part of two years restoring her. The Wilma Lee was built in 1940. A lot of work went into the restoration. It ended up that we needed a new mast, which was very significant, and um, many other a, a, just a whole laundry list of repairs that took the better part. But she's ship shape now and she's ready to go. And now that she's ready to sail, the museum is preparing a whole curriculum for the students who will be learning some first hand lessons starting this fall. We're going to take kids out um, on the out into the bay and they can go to the reef. Um, we're going to also do things like 
um, water quality off the boat. We have a dredge where we'll dredge um, and pick up animals and they'll be able to um, see what's on the bottom. Kathy Wasuta is the museum's education program coordinator. Our museum itself is based all on oysters, so we like to focus on that, but we'll definitely take the kids out just for the experience of using a real boat that oystermen used and putting up the sails and learning about the different parts of the boat. The museum is taking steps to ensure the safety for both visitors and crew. For COVID, uh, we have are at half capacity. So the boat is Coast Guard certified to carry 47 passengers. We carry you know 23, including uh, crew and captain. So we have demarcations where people can you know that they are socially distanced. Rick Flamon is the lead captain for the Wilma Lee. I'll tell you, I have a sense of pride, a sense of responsibility, um, because it's. Uh, historic artifact. Flamand says the boat attracts a lot of attention. We get a lot of boats that come by and take our picture uh, and ask us, is that a skipjack? And yes, it's one of 22 still floating. The museum will also be offering the public the chance to ride the historic skipjack with heritage and sunset cruises. Flamand says he hopes a ride on the Wilma Lee will bring a new appreciation for the important role the skipjacks have played. It's a piece of history. You don't want to forget it. You want to learn from it. On the Wilma Lee, Sue Copen for State Circle. Sue, thank you. That is State Circle for this week. For all of us at MPT, thanks for watching and have a good night. This program was made by MPT to serve all of our diverse communities. Programs on MPT are made possible by our members and the following. Listen up, Maryland. The 2020 election is coming up. Make your vote count. Eligible voters can stay safe and vote by mail. It's easy, but you must be registered to vote and make sure your ballot request is received before October 20th. When you receive your